Welcome to the RSP Boiler Room. I'm Matt Waldman with the Rookie Scouting Portfolio. Today we are in for a treat because we're going to get to watch a player I'm really excited about, Peyton Barber, the running back for the Auburn Tigers. And Barber is a redshirt sophomore who declared early and surprised Auburn with his declaration to go to the NFL draft. He's a player that was a starter for his first time this year. He was on the scout team in 2014, but while on that scout team, working behind the likes of starters like Cameron Artis Payne, it was Trey Mason, the, the Rams running back, who said that Barber was the best running back on Auburn's team right now. Barber was just kind of working through some mistakes. He'd get kind of down on himself for some of the mistakes that he would make early in his career as a, as a redshirt freshman. This year started off uh, like gangbusters down the stretch. As my Twitter followers, some of them have said, he statistically faded. But I thought, let's look at a game where he statistically faded, quote unquote, to see really what's going on because I don't believe in box score scouting. I believe that actually games where a player doesn't even have really strong stats or maybe even weak box score stats are often as telling, if not more telling, about their talent than games where they have huge outputs. And this is a good example of one against Alabama in the Iron Bowl, the, the number one team in the nation at this point, one of the best teams that have been around over the past decade in a, in a squad filled with potential NFL talent on defense. So watching this is going to be, I, I think, very enlightening for a lot of people once we look at a player's process, the decision making, the techniques that he displays, the concepts that he understands about blocking schemes. When you look at all those things and put it together, you don't have to see a guy rip off beautiful runs to see most of what he's going to have to offer at this position. And I've noticed this in the past with players like Ahmad Bradshaw, Matt Forte, Joseph Adai. I've seen games where they perform far worse. So let's go ahead and start this game, and I'll take you through a lot of the things that I look at when I'm examining running back play. And we're going to watch this game in slow motion, and I want to thank the Draft Breakdown crew for putting together these cut-ups so quickly. Um, and being able to be responsive in the manner that they were to just a request that I had and I don't make a lot of them I haven't this is really the first one I've ever made just asking if there could be some more tape on him because I thought they would benefit by having folks um, get a chance to see a back who may not be really well known but I think is going to make some noise in a training camp or somewhere down the line within the next season or two in the NFL he's that good so let's start off with this game here. What we're going to see is a, as a part of his game in this is him as a blocker. We're going to see 13 blocking assignments in the game. Some of them are as a lead blocker. And in Clemson's system, you often are going to see this type of a play where it's an outside run with a jet sweep, and you're going to see the running back as the lead blocker. Barber gets downhill. He gauges his block. And he does a good job of cutting across the body of the defensive back, knocking out the knee, so he's got good height here, drops the man, and gives the ball carrier room. It's not a it's not a huge blot, it's not a huge gain here, but it was a positive play by Barber. And let's take a look at it real quick one more time as he gets outside here. I want you to see some of the technique one more time. Because there are some things he can improve. And I think it's important. A lot of people say, oh, well, if he makes the effort, he's going to get better. He'll improve. I don't really judge blocking all that highly. Well, you know what? Maybe you should. You know, it doesn't mean you have to give them a lot of points in your evaluation, but it is worthwhile to have strict standards for what you expect a good blocker to do and to be able to articulate what it is that they are are not doing. In this case, look at Look at Barber. He's got that good position. He's got good height on the block, but he also has his head down. So when he goes to turn here, he doesn't really have a lot of control of being able to see how far along he is or to gauge the contact that he's going to make. You want the head up when you're trying to cut block. 
in this case he does a good job but we're going to see others in this particular game where having the head up would have made a bigger difference now here's an interesting play and we're going to show you a little bit more about where he's at he's going to be the running back working across on a defensive end okay Get him, he, watch him get square, he shoots his arms out, he gets them into the chest, and he actually delivers enough of a blow that the defensive tackle or defensive end on this play's shoulders actually go backwards. So you're looking at a back who just generated a decent amount of force on a stand-up block with a defensive end and has enough agility and wherewithal to slide on this play after the hit reestablish his position, get his hands into the side, the, the inside shoulder, and move this defender away just enough so that the quarterback can make the play. This is, you know, this is big time stuff. A big time back, most of the big time backs are able to handle defensive linemen on a limited basis. And Peyton Barber is one of those guys that's showing that right here. He's got the strength, He's got the willingness to follow up. He's got the movement to be able to slide. The, you know, this is going to help him out in the NFL that he's even got the technique down, stand-up wise, to hang. Same thing here. We got him off the side. He steps up. He's facing the defensive tackle coming around the, the center on a twist. And look at him launch into the defender. Now this is what you would probably say is some overextension. It's not technically perfect in terms of what you want a blocker to do. But he's got a huge size disadvantage against this big boy. And the fact that he launches in and delivers a shot is enough to slow the defender enough for the quarterback to already begin his release. Of course, when you hit someone this hard and off balance, that defender can use some of that momentum to his advantage. Now, the defender only gets a hand on the quarterback, doesn't even shove him. And you're going to see that in this next viewing from this side. So watch the defender coming in. Look at that. He's got his hips bent tries to you know deliver at least some level of a punch it was enough to help you should you're not going to expect him to lock down a player of that size you just expect him to get in the way and be somewhat of a uh, you know somewhat of a help and he was so here we go we got some motion here to a 20 personnel set but they're going to run the fake ghost you know, goes to the jet sweep and then throw this bullet route into the flat. We're going to show this one more time. Watch him work up the seam and catch the ball over his shoulder. Nice use of his hands. Get downhill. And with a with the defender working, you know, down this flat, we may see one little clue of Barber's speed, which is uh a really fast back is probably going to feel confident that he can beat this angle even though the defensive back has the initial angle downhill. Barber sees this and decides it's time for him to try and cut back or at least slow the defender down and try and work outside. So that gives you maybe some indication that he knows his speed isn't, you know, top drawer, long speed, third gear type of work in this situation. But I think that he's got plenty of quickness, good burst, and enough speed to be an every down back in the NFL. It's going to be interesting to watch him at the combine and see what type of 40 he runs um, and what his short area splits are in terms of short area speed. Here's his first run of the day. And it's not, you know, it doesn't look all that exciting, but it's actually, this is stuff that I love. These short runs can be far more exciting when you project the fact that this is what you're going to see in the NFL oftentimes. Tighter creases, the need to understand blocking scheme, 
and how to utilize your power. And here we've got the left guard pulling to the right side with the fullback clearing then the outside. And we see Barber dip inside and then try and split this crease between a defensive tackle and the edge defensive back here. And he does a nice job of splitting it with some power and getting enough of a push to fall forward for almost four yards on this play. And the, the gap scheme didn't work out quite where he wanted it to because this got all clogged up here. He reads this very well. And you can see with his steps, it has a lot to do with what his eyes see. See the, the little hop, the shorter step? He sees that this isn't going to work out. So he's slowing down his process, and then when he sees that, that opening to cut back through, he hits it hard enough, gets the pads low, drives, starts to get the head up a little bit, but not quite enough at this point where he's dropped down immediately upon contact. But you're going to see more examples of better pad level with the head up. But still, it's a, you know, it's a nice cutback. It's a nice decision given the situation to turn really a no-gainer or a loss into a three-yard gain against a defensive tackle and an edge defender two-on-one. Here's another cut block, and you can see here he drops his head and misses the cut block altogether, but it forces the defender away just enough that the ball carrier is able to get inside. You know, in this case, I'd like to see obviously a better cut block, and this is a this is a type of situation where if he keeps his head up, he can close the gap a little bit longer. He's going to take a little longer time to close the gap because he's going to see how far he really is before he makes his dive, and he'll end up making contact more often. But even when you miss. If you make the effort, sometimes that clears the way, and the, the runner obviously gets the first down here. A lot of these plays, as we're seeing, are against six-man boxes and nickel. This is something that often happens when you're playing you know, this type of system, um, this type of offensive system. You're going to get some of that um, where you have them, you at least have a what you would say is a, you know, a nickel look, not a stacked box in any way. We're going to see the, left, the right guard pull to the left with the fullback working behind to the inside. And there's some decent burst to get ahead and actually gain about three yards on this play. Again, look at the feet. Watch how he starts this play. It's a slower this is actually a faster one. This is actually more of a faster, decisive move. He anticipates what he's going to have to do. Let's see what he's reading here. As he takes this read, he sees this backside defender coming around. He also, and that's probably peripherally that he's seeing this, he also sees that he's got a nice push up front, which means that he's likely going to have a nice crease here to hit if he can hit it hard. So look at the length of the steps and he gets just enough ahead that the backside pursuit doesn't reach him until the line of scrimmage and then he's wrapped and pulled down and he falls forward for three. That's good decision making. He understands the pace, the development of the blocking scheme and he hits it decisively as opposed to some of the other schemes that we saw where he had to wait a little bit more because things got um, clogged up where he was supposed to go and he had room to be able to wait on his decision making. So you're seeing someone who can discern the difference between you know when to wait and when to react fast. Alright, so this play the, is more of him enacting a play fake and giving the running the quarterback room to work outside. We're to move forward a little more here. Now we're looking at a third and five. Got a stacked. We've got a, a nickel look here. Again, we're going to have some pulling action to the outside with the fullback 
kind of getting clogged up behind here and that leaves the runner to have to really just kind of hit this hole as hard as he can and just attack and what I like about this is you're gonna see this play and, and some people will say well on gap plays you shouldn't run into the back of your lineman this is very true but also there are times especially in short yardage situations where if you're trying to hit a crease he's not gonna try and bounce outside here he knows that if he tries to bounce this outside Alabama has the numbers to stop him for a loss if he tries to cut back to the inside then he's ruining the seal block to his right and his only real option here is to probably work inside and try and cut back which is a risky play in a short yardage situation and third and five in the in the red zone is kind of a short yardage situation so the the other option that he has at this point is to try and just ram it through here and that's what he does he runs into his centers back and pushes the center into the defensive tackle and rides over top and turns his play with a little bit more effort into about a two to three yard gain again it's a safe play and you want that safety especially in the red area because you try and bounce this outside and lose more yards or you try to make too much happen in this compressed area of the field leads to mistakes that can really cost you you don't want that you want conservative play at the right moments the right field position the right down and distance and he's showing this another lead block again see him dive too far you're seeing that his stand-up game is pretty darn good against quality players um, bigger athletes He's willing to engage, punch, square up, but his lead blocking, not so great. But ask yourself this question. When you're looking at today's NFL, how many of them are playing Gus Malzahn's system to the extent that they are going to use the running back as a lead blocker? I don't think you're going to find too many out there, if any. So while... It would be nice for him to get better at this, especially if he's going to cut block in the passing game. The fact that he's so willing to stay on his feet and engage and do good work as a stand-up blocker against bigger men as a passing down back probably speaks well for him. Don't you think? Now this is a really pretty run. We're going to show this one a little bit more. This is a sweep going to see two guards pulling get some counter action with this receiver ghosting across on the jet sweeps of the right but barber takes this immediately turns outside he's going to ride along the front side guards pull starts to read he sees a crease developing to the inside of that front side guard here probably also at least feels the space being made at the second level block and he works outside just enough to continue to push this block and look at this cut it's a nice lateral cut at full speed to get downhill and then make a second dip to get inside this defender now he doesn't completely clear this defender this we're not looking at Adrian Peterson or even a Ryan Matthews here or a Matt Forte who comes downhill makes that second cut and completely makes the linebacker miss that's not the kind of player he is at least we're not seeing this on this play but the fact that he can make a second dip here and at least eliminate the head-on angle and turn this into instead of getting tackle right here gaining another three yards two to three yards on this play because of that second dip that's nice turns into a third and one to a, instead of a third and four and look at this look at this cut and look at the high and tight ball carriage under the left arm here on the outside nice stuff nice little cut there and he's playing at really good speed as he does this looks a little like his second cousin there in the way that he can he can make
make some cuts. Marion was a little more violent with his jump cuts though. But this is still a smooth back in terms of his change of direction and the speed in which he executes it. All right, we'll move on from this reverse that didn't work out very well. Or at least hopefully here, let's see. Yeah. That's that's the replay of that reverse that didn't work out. Let's move on to the next. All right. More lead blocking. Patient enough to wait for his opportunity and then turn uphill and while he He's a little over aggressive because he feels like he doesn't have the speed probably to match this defensive back and really close the gap for contact. He at least tries to push. It doesn't have an impact on this play, but it gives you a little clue once again that maybe top speed, his top speed isn't as fast as maybe I thought. I was talking to my buddy Sigmund Bloom earlier today about him and said that maybe I wouldn't be surprised if he had 4-4 speed, but the more I watch him, the more I think that he's probably more in the 4-5, 4-6 range. If he's faster than that, I'm going to be super excited about it. Um, but I don't think that, I think to be conservative, he's probably going to be more in that 4-5-ish range, um, which is still very good for a 225 pound back. especially when you have this type of quickness and control over your feet combined with power. This is another patient run. Okay, we're going to look at, we've got the pull from the left guard moving to the right. This is going to open a crease. You've got three men blocking here. You've got a seal to the right side. And look at Barber, bounce to the inside, bounce to the right here, press this lane, and then bounce back out to the left which totally baits this penetration up the middle. Here's the penetration coming clean, bounce inside out, stretches that hole and works around it, hits the linebacker, forcing the linebacker downfield, gets also hit by the defensive end and drags this defensive back and another yard. And I wouldn't say dragged, the defensive end as big as he is basically force the momentum forward but when you have good pad level and you're fighting through and you and you force defenders to have to take an angle of pursuit they're going to help you get yards too another nice effort on this defensive end he gets he gets his body downhill now he delivers with his forearms first with a punch but then he gets his hands in there. You can see that just a little bit here before it gets blurry. Let's see if we can show it one more time. Watch his hands work out. So now that he's kind of pushing to the side. It's a nice job in terms of helping out on a double team there. He was aggressive and he followed up. That's pretty much what you're looking for, you know, on a play like that. Again nice work with these hops you know you may say well I want to I want a player who's more controlled with the steps that's good you may want to that there's one way to look at it but also if you can use the hops in this way where it's a uh, smaller changes of direction like this this is clearly controlled work this isn't a guy who is hesitant or tentative Okay, there's a difference here and there are drills you'll see where backs are trained to make these types of hops and movements it's not just about avoiding people it's about controlling your feet to generate momentum to stay downhill but to be able to move in a fashion that opens up spaces for you and that's exactly what this does here by that hop to the inside which sets up this full back working outside and then hopping back inside of that so that he has pressed and cut back through this small lane working through getting a yard before he's dragged by one linebacker and then makes contact with another and you're looking at a back who's gotten a little over three yards on this play before he's pushed backwards it's a pretty nice run through a small crease because this truly is a small crease 
Watch it one more time and look at those feet. Again, this is not a back who's hesitant. This is a back who's controlling the situation and creating space. And these small spaces are the types of plays that he's going to have to manipulate when he's in the NFL. Now you'd like to see a little lower pad level here on this particular play. And I've seen him play with a lot lower pad level than this. Because when you aren't low enough, you're going to get pushed back. And Reggie Ragland does a nice job there. But you're going to see some, if you watch more of his games, you're going to see some really impressive displays of pad level. I mean, flat-backed pad level that gets under defenders, drives through them, and the like. This play, I'm not really sure what happened. You're going to see it um, out here maybe in the replay. I don't know whether he went out for a pass or if he just overran this defender and didn't see it and it was too late. Happens. But I think that you're going to see in the second half here where Barber's weakness is greatest as a pass protector. And that's against more advanced pass blitzing assignments. Blitz overloads, twists, stunts, things of that like. He tends to be a little more confused about who he's supposed to have and working in conjunction with his linemen. And I think if he gets better at that, he can become a top-notch blocker in the NFL. All right, so watching this play one more time. Let's get it to start over here. Here we go. This is an inside zone. You see him work towards the double team. And then cut back inside. Beat this defensive tackle through the crease, which is a good sign of nice quickness there because that defensive tackle got free pretty easily. And then hit this crease and just push at least another yard and fall forward. He gets four yards on this play. Not exciting if you're looking for, you know, figure skater runs. But if you're looking for creativity, patience, understanding of a blocking scheme, and how to use a variety of your skills in a short area of space, that's what running back play is often about, down in and down out in the NFL. why backs like Marion Barber get it. That's why backs like Spencer Ware get it. That's why backs like mm, Melvin Gordon don't always get it early on. And Melvin Gordon's going to be a pretty good back, I think. He didn't have a lot of help with an offensive line, but at the same time, he didn't have to do a lot of this work at Wisconsin on a consistent basis in the way that we're looking at Peyton Barber do it. There's a play once again where Barber misses the cut block for the most part. He makes some contact to the leg, and the head isn't fully up when he drops down to the ground. And as a result, he's not getting enough depth into the defender on this cut block. And you're going to see it from a different angle here. He drops a little too much, but he does get some contact to the inside leg that forces the defender back, and we get a nice lane opening up because of it. Again, how often are we going to see this in the NFL? Not likely. What counts more is whether he can make good cuts as a pass protector. Now I like this play, and this is probably a play that people go, oh, well it's kind of dull. He doesn't even get it. He, he barely makes it back to the line of scrimmage here. But you're going to see two things about a player in this type of situation that are telling about them. I saw it from Ahmad Bradshaw against Tennessee years ago when Tennessee was still under Philip Fulmer with a top-ranked defense in the country. And that's how aggressive are you? How willing are you to get past the line of aggression to almost recklessness? And in this play, he knows that this crease is getting pushed back. There's a pushback here, and the line of scrimmage has been reset by Alabama in the backfield. And it's time for him to say, you know what, I'm going to attack. And he goes airborne, takes a hit head on, spins off that contact, lands on his feet, and then continues to pull, even though he's getting dragged down by Reggie Ragland here by the, you know, pull to his backside. 
and he continues to push forward. I like that effort. I would rather have a back who tries this hard, even in these situations, at the risk of him making mistakes because he's he's trying too hard and you get him to kind of pull it back a little bit than a back who isn't willing to try at all. Effort. Once again, it's another play that I love about Peyton Barber because it's about effort. It, it, it fits that storyline that he was hard on himself when he made mistakes at the scout team and it slowed his progress a little bit. You don't want him to be overwhelmed and, and get into a hole and get into a funk, but I haven't seen him do that in the games I've seen thus far when he made mistakes. He didn't get into a funk. He kept, he kept moving along, and I think that's part of maturation when you're a young man. I see that plenty of times with young men and young women at this age range in their late teens, early 20s, um, where they make mistakes, they get into a hole a little bit, and they learn, they mature enough as part of this maturation process of becoming adults that, hey, look, mistakes happen, you just got to keep moving on. And I think Barber's learned this, but this is, a, this is an example where he squares his body and he tries to extend and see how far he extends to try and get into position against this defensive end. Once you overextend like that, the defender knows he's got you. He slaps down Barber's hands. That sends Barber off balance, and now he's got the angle. But look at Barber here. He doesn't give up or pout. He turns right around and chases. And while he doesn't get contact with this defender, he does enough to say, hey, look, just in case, I'm going to I'm going to keep chasing after you until there is no opportunity for me to chase you anymore. That's the kind of effort you want to see in the light of mistakes. You don't want players who pout. You don't want players who you know, get down on themselves and are self-indulgent about what they do or don't do. This is a guy whose head is in the game and his effort is, I'm going to play to the whistle. He gets beat and the urgency is still there to the very end. That's an intangible that you can see on film. And you see enough of those types of plays, you know what kind of player this guy is. You know what he's willing to do. And it's not going to get counteracted by what he does off the field. You know, character is a whole other issue, and we can talk about what they do off the field in terms of, you know, if there's criminal behavior, that's one thing. But if you have reputation issues about maybe he asks too many questions and doesn't always get along with certain coaches and you have, you know, more complex situations that you have to untangle, you know, if anyone questions whether the guy gives his effort and whether he's someone that gives up on things, if you see enough tape of what we just saw, that example there, where he's working hard throughout the play, you can ignore what some some of these people are saying. Now here's a cut block against number 56, pretty healthy sized outside linebacker I would say or edge man. Gets in gets square, head up a little bit more, hits that outside leg and knocks him off balance. Ends up getting the man on top of him. Now the the quarterback has to deal with this pressure to the inside but this is the right assignment here for Barber because you need you take the earliest defender to you on the edge here at this point when there's that great of a distance between two men delivering pressure good block so maybe he's not a great stock blocker when it comes to cut blocking that's a hard skill to have but when it comes to blocking the edge as a cut blocker, he's a little better. Got that head up still. You can see that face mask up through this line a little bit more. Does enough. I'll take him and work with him if I were, a, if I were an offensive coach, if I were a running backs coach, offensive coordinator. I'd be happy with a back like this. And Auburn wouldn't be starting him and using him as a blocker as much as they did. 13 assignments against Alabama. You know, I usually see somewhere between five to seven assignments for most backs against a team. 
If you've got 13 blocking assignments, they think you can block. And I think for the most part, he's proven them right more often as a pass protector than as a run blocker. All right, so we see him doing some work downhill. He's not part of the equation on this pass play. That's fine. We'll move on to the next play here in a moment. And I like the thinking here. This is a this is a player who's thinking about all angles. Comes downhill, tries to close off the edge first, make sure that no one's coming outside, then slides outside on the slot defender. Slide continues to slide very well so that he gets outside. Now he overextends a bit, but the angle that he's facing this defender, he's not gonna have to worry about the defender doing anything to to hurt this overextension. He gets inside and then continues to work and push that defender again to get him around the pocket. That's effort. It's also some displays of decent technique, even if he's not the fastest guy or his angle is diagnosed super isn't super accurate. And when you have a defender coming from that distance away, when you have a defender, let's see if we can show it here. When you have a defender coming away from this distance, oh, I didn't show it right. Let's see if I can find it here. Sorry, folks. Do it one more time here. All right. Look at the distance that he has to gauge. It's a pretty good clip. It's kind of like a stock block. So the fact that he's got to stalk him and kind of get positioned from this far of a distance, he did pretty well. I'll take that. He's only going to get better at this, I think. Again, you're looking at a guy who's played one full season at major college football level other than the scout team, and he's doing this against Alabama. It's kind of the Cardale Jones argument, which is look at what he's doing against cop top competition, with a minimal level of experience, you, you can't discount that. You have to add value to that on certain level. All right, so this game's still close, and that's what—that's another interesting aspect of this game. Is you know, it's 1913. We're in the fourth quarter, and here's where Barber makes some mistakes. Okay. This is an overload blitz situation from the left side for Auburn. You've got three defenders here attacking, and for some reason, Barber just completely ignores this outside man thinking he's got to help out with the fullback. Just completely misses the block. This is just an assignment error. It's a clear assignment error when you let a guy come right by you <laughs> and he like just runs right by you. I mean like you can probably see what he ate for breakfast if he didn't brush his teeth. I'm talking about how close he was. But what I like too is when he discovers that the defender that he missed the block and the play's still alive he doesn't pout, he doesn't stop, he turns back around and tries to block number 10 here to get in the way, but the quarterback slips trying to stop his feet. So again, yeah, I screwed up, but what's going on that I can do to try and fix something here? That's team play. Team players don't say what went wrong and who went wrong who did it wrong and whose fault it was. We can sort that out later. Team play is something's going wrong. How do we fix it right now? And that's that attitude that he took. Another nice little run. Yeah, it's a short gain. But seriously, folks, 
nice little footwork to work inside out and then cut back downhill baiting this linebacker and getting inside him just enough to fall forward for two to three yards it's a nice gain on first and ten and he's not trying to be the hero trying to work outside and bounce it where there's no way he's going to get around 22 there's no way he's going to do that is he going to reverse his field when 29's free here i don't think so either it's make do with what you've got against a really good defensive front that's screwing up the the line and he still gets positive yards, gets three yards on the play. And that's what happens in the NFL, down in and down out. How do I work through this mosh pit of a situation where the blocks didn't go exactly as designed? Am I going to gain positive yards from that where it's not perfect? Or am I going to be making excuses about how the blocking wasn't good? All right, so let's look at this play because we saw him catch the ball over his front shoulder, his inside shoulder in the first quarter of this game. And this one's a more difficult catch. It's probably one of the more underrated um, types of targets of difficulty. When you're heading downhill, the ball's thrown behind you. This time it's due to pressure. And he has to reach behind and, and try and bend low for the pass. He should have caught the ball. No question about it. But wasn't able to. He almost got the rebound type of play where I think even backs in the NFL, probably I would say six out of ten of the running backs in the NFL um, don't catch that pass consistently. Here's another missed assignment. See the defensive and defensive then come through here. And this is a twist. We're going to watch this twist one more time. You're going to see what I mean here. This is a 3 3 5 look, but you're only seeing two of the linebackers in the play here. They're going to show double A gap pressure before the sack. The A gap is on either side of the center. And what happens is the running backs looking to this A-gap pressure thinking, all right, am I going to help out with this A-gap? Reggie Ragland, number 10, coming through here to the guard, to the inside of the guard. I don't have to do that. So now I can focus on the inside where I see both of these defenders heading. But we have ourselves some game run here. And this is when you have game like this where one player is twisting inside and the other one twists outside and they reverse rolls like this, you can screw up who's supposed to take who. And clearly the left tackle and the running back get their lines crossed and neither get the defensive end working to the inside. The running back gets the outside man and the tackle is left standing. Now who messed this up? I don't know. And it's something that we would have to ask. I'm going to assume, though, it's the running back in this case because he had he let the man through. And it looked like he was very decisive about taking the outside man. So most likely, and also I give the benefit of the doubt to the linemen because they tend to be a little bit better with um, assignment-oriented football of this nature. They're a little bit more experienced with it on a down-in, down-out basis. Though common sense would tell you if you're a big man and you let a big man through against a little man, that may not be a good idea. But, you know, that's that's kind of common sense, you know, casual fan logic that oftentimes makes sense. Uh, but we'll, you know, maybe we'll find out one day. Here's another pass opportunity. Working outside, makes a catch with his hands close to his body, still gets a foot in bounds. see if we see any more runs in this. Most likely we're not. Yeah, we're going to see a little bit more passing here. But so far what you're seeing with with Barber that I think is important to note is you've got really good functional power. 
And this game isn't even nearly as good as, say, the Mississippi State game, where you see him truly just attack and dig out defenders as a power runner, someone who hits the hole with a type of conviction that you see in this game, but not, but even amped up a little more earlier. Now this is a play that I want to share that I really like. He's getting walked back by, I believe his name is Deshaun Hand. I know his last name's Hand. It's a kid from Woodbridge, Virginia. He's a 270 pound sophomore. What's interesting about this 270 pound sophomore playing wide nine coming head down on a running back who's squared with a wide base and slowing down this push enough for the running back for the quarterback to throw the ball is that Mr. Hand here has during the summer bench pressed 225 pounds about 42 times which would have been more than any defensive end last year or defensive player last year at the NFL Combine Okay, and he's done over 40 multiple times according to um, his local trainer as well as um, I believe an Alabama article mentioned other trainers in Alabama that he's been doing it when, when, now that he's back at Alabama. So even a guy who might be the strongest defensive lineman on the team and one Mr. Barber is holding his own against him. It's a strong back. It's a willing back. And he's doing what needs to be done, even though the wide receiver here didn't do what needed to be done. You gotta like, you know, what you're seeing here is high effort, high intensity, someone who is physical, a guy who can block, who can catch, and can certainly run between the tackles, and hasn't had a lot of room to show what he can do when he gets into the open field. None of these plays have really broken into the open field under that one swing pass in the first quarter. And he may not be the most dynamic runner, but you see that he's, a, I would say, a singles and doubles hitter at the very least, and he's doing it against an overmatched offensive line. So with that in mind, keep an eye on, Mary, on Peyton Barber and... Uh, see what he does at the combine in his workouts and see where he lands because he might be one of the better running backs in this draft class despite the fact that he doesn't have the resume or experience um, for most people to acknowledge that. Thanks again for watching. I'm Matt Walden with the Rookie Scouting Portfolio and you can find more of my work at my YouTube channel the RSP Film Room and also my blog at www.mattwaldmanrsp.com